I wanted to start out giving three tips for the manipulator. Remember that if you are feeling as though somebody's manipulating you, generally so that we're not confusing it with something else, what that means is you feel as though somebody's taking advantage of your good nature to get you to do things for them that you don't feel good about doing. If you find you're in that position, try these three things. Number one, ask them if it sounds reasonable what they're asking you to do. So when, if they're saying, you know, what they might do is set you up as somebody who you're not doing anything tonight, right? Well, then why don't you help me out with the blah, blah, blah? Ask somebody, well, does that sound reasonable to you that because I don't have plans tonight that I therefore would be the best choice to help you with an extra project or to stay after work by myself or to, you know, to volunteer my personal precious time when I'm not getting anything in return for that. So when you think that something is unreasonable, spell it out and ask them, do you believe that that's reasonable? Does this sound reasonable to you that I, and then explain what it is that you believe they're asking you to do. Number two, if you're finding it difficult to get out of it, you know, to say no, if you're finding yourself kind of boxed in, remember to say, I'll think about it. And if you find that there is a manipulator in your life that is that has crossed boundaries and you want to stop. You want the manipulative relationship to stop. Be consistent. Anytime they ask you to do anything, if you possibly can, if it sounds at all reasonable to you to say this, tell them, let me think about it. Start putting yourself in the driver's seat, letting them know, when you make a request of me, I'm going to stop and think about it. I'm not just going to say yes or no, because you're asking me in the moment. I'm going to decide, to decide. Remember that to decide, decidir, means to cut off from all other possibilities. I'm going to be the one who's going to decide to cut off other possibilities in my life. That will be me. And number three, ask them why they want you to do what it is that they're, that they're asking you to do. If they're asking you to stay after work, if they're asking you to help them out with the project, why? And it might not necessarily be in the order that I just gave you. You might start out by asking somebody, why are you asking me to do that? And then if they say, well, because I thought you'd be the best choice, because you don't have any kids to take care of after work, so I thought you might have the time. Does that sound reasonable to you, that simply because I don't have dependents at home, therefore my time is less valuable and I should volunteer it for projects such as this one? And then at the very end, you might say, well, let me think about that and I'll get back to you. And remember that you can always say no. If you find it difficult saying no, tell people, I can't. And when you tell somebody in response to a request that they make a simple, I can't do that, whether it's for money or time, because that's what people are always asking us for at work, right? Either our time or our money. As if, <laughs> as if we are at work because we have lots of extra time and money, so we thought we'd just kind of spend the day there. If you find it difficult saying no to people who are asking you for those two things, simply say, I can't. And when they say to you, or wait, excuse me, when you say to somebody, I can't, what's the number one response, Andrew, that people give you when you tell them, I can't. Why not? Why not? That's what they always say. How come? Why not? Remember, you just told them you cannot. It is not our obligation to explain ourselves to anybody. So when you say to somebody in response to, why not? Because I simply can't. Watch how when you do that, most people will go, oh, okay, I understand. Like you just give them a reason. So I can't do that. Why not? Because I simply can't. And if they push it, well, what are you doing? I simply can't. Well, why not? Well, because I, I simply cannot. Use the broken record. So remember, ask people, why? Why me? Number two, ask people, does that sound reasonable to you? Number three, tell people, you'll think about it. And if you say no, simply say, I can't. And when they say, why not? Because I simply can't. And if they push it, use the broken record. Very simple. But what tends to happen is kind of people and courteous people and generous people get manipulated. You know, there's always a price that we pay. Your gift is your curse. Your curse is your gift. So if by nature you are a giving person, you will tend to have a lot of people who are takers around you. And it's difficult sometimes to find that line, you know, where we feel good about giving. Remember that the, 
the uh, test of are you an effective communicator? You know, the, the ultimate test is not going to be what your coworkers think of you. You know, like a lot of times people will say, you just let people take advantage of you. Really? Is it maybe? Maybe not. Maybe you're more compassionate. Maybe you're more giving than other people. But the true test of if you are or are not an effective communicator is how you feel about it. That is it. How you feel. How you feel about the results you're getting and how you're getting them. So if you feel good about it, if you feel good about giving, give. If you feel not so good about giving, or if you feel as though you've given enough, start pulling it back because you need to feel good about the results you're getting and how you're getting them. That is the only judge, that's the only test of whether or not you are an effective communicator. No one else can judge that for you. Uh, Do we have any other questions, Andrew? Well, we had a tip from Jupiter. Hey, Jupiter, hey, how are you? Oh, a tip tip. Jupiter, I just can't tell you how refreshing it is to see you every, every time. Thank you, Jupiter. I appreciate that. Andrew's going to – Andrew, what did you do last time? You did something fancy with your tip. He did. What did you do? Well, I thought he did that. But didn't you do – like, didn't you take your girlfriend out or something? Yes. He did. He took his girlfriend out. Yeah, you did because you got that tip. I paid it to you, didn't I? Yes. I don't know if I did. Thank you, Jupiter. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? Yes. What? Criers. I love the crybaby because from who? Annie SS. Annie SS. By the way, if you could give us some feedback on this audio, I would appreciate it because <laughs> it's very <laughs> ugly. Crap. <laughs> okay, thanks. I will uh, do something different the next time. Um, the crybaby. There are three steps. I love three step processes or process because it's. Three is a magic number for the brain. That's why we divide phone numbers into threes or uh, license plates are generally chunked into three numbers or three, three, two chunks of three. We got another tip uh, from Jolanda. Hey, Jolanda. Thank you. Oh, Jolanda. Do you remember that song? Yolanda, you look so fine. Yolanda, Yolanda. So every time I hear your name, I will think of that and the tip. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, the crybaby goes like this. You want to have, now by the way, there's a difference between somebody who cries and a crybaby. Somebody who cries because they are, let's say, emotional or what, you know, whatever, they've just lost somebody, that we put up with, you know. A crybaby is going to be somebody who tries to get out of something, skirt responsibility, avoid situations or conversations using crying as their weapon of choice, you know, as their defense mechanism. So there are some people when we try to tell them something, you know that they're going to start crying and then, you know, then the conversation is over, so they think. That's not how we're going to do it from now on. So when you have a crier and you need to sit down and talk to them about something and you think, I know the waterworks are going to start, you want to have three things ready. Number one, you want to have a bottle of, <laughs> this is not a bottle, but you want to have a bottle of water. Pretend this is water. We don't, we, we, we don't drink water here. That's off limits. We drink Pepsi Cola. <laughs> it's not water. It's a wicked witch. Have your bottle of water. That's prop number one. Remember that props in communication are very helpful. We like props. They give us something to do. They're, they act as visual reminders. And they are handy because we're going to take this prop and put it on the desk and have it ready for the crybaby. Okay? The other thing we're going to have ready for them is a box of tissue. So I'm going to pretend that this box is a box of tissue. And we're going to put that on the desk as well. Okay? And the number three thing we're going to have ready is our verbal tactics. And the verbal tactics that we're going to use are, number one, we're going to use an empowering statement. And, number, and we'll also use an empathy statement. And empower, I'm trying to remember the names. We have the empathy statement, an empowering statement. That's it. Those are the two things. Okay. So here's how you use these things. Remember that an adult human being finds it almost impossible to sob with their heads lifted up. You'll notice that when you watch talk shows or when you watch people cry a lot, I'm hoping that that happens mostly on television and not in your real life, but when you, when you watch people cry, we tend to go, and we'll put our heads down and we'll sob with our heads in our hands, because with our head in our hands, because... That's how human adults cry with their heads down. 
you don't normally see people lifting their heads up and sobbing. You'll see people do things like, oh, I don't know who baby daddy is. Oh, and they'll be like, I think it's you, or is it you? I don't, I don't know. And the point is, they lift their heads up and they stop for a moment because it's difficult for humans who are adults. Children can. But it's, it's difficult for an adult to lift their head while sobbing. That's why expressions such as keep your chin up exist. You know, keep your chin up. It helps you to not cry. If you find yourself, if you find it difficult to keep your emotions in check, remember, Keep your chin up. It really does help. And you'll talk about people who will look up at the light. That's because, not because of the light. It's because they're lifting their chin up. And you'll notice that like in uh, interrogation sessions or when people are accustomed to having people emotionally out of control with them, they frequently offer them a glass of water. And that's why we have our bottle of water. It is not to hydrate them. It's because that act of drinking makes you lift your chin up. So again, chins up, chins up, chins up. Okay, that said, when you're talking with somebody, you know, Jane, I want to talk about what happened the other day. Oh, I know. They start crying. Here's what you do now. You have your props ready, and you use an empathy statement so that you don't sound or look like you're totally cold-hearted. Something such as, I can see you're very upset by this. That's all. Okay? So when somebody starts to cry, I can see you're very upset by this. Then step number two is grab your props. Grab your tissues and your bottle of water and say, here, take a drink of water, and here's the tissue. Okay, that's step number two now. Now that you've done that, you've given them something to do to counter their crying. I've told you I can recognize you're upset. Why don't you take these? And now I'm going to deliver my empowering statement. And the empowering statement means I'm going to empower you to make a choice here right now. The choice you're going to make is to go ahead right now and finish this talk without all the waterworks, or you can take a moment to compose yourself and come back and finish this talk. Which would, it li which would you like? And we're going to say it like this. And you can use this empowering statement, by the way, on the telephone or in meetings. If you have somebody with you who is, let's say, out of control yelling or something like that, who's using profanity, Mark, 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 Mark. Remember to interrupt somebody. You keep using their name over and over again because we, are, we feel compelled to say, what, when somebody keeps saying our name over and over again. So... If, you know, Andrew has a nasty temper, I mean, he's, you know, this, he's throwing things and yelling and screaming. And so I might say, Andrew, 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 Andrew. I don't appreciate that type of language here in my home or at the office, even though it's the same thing. Now, I'd be willing to continue this conversation with you, but not in this manner. Do you want to continue this now? Do you think that you're all right? Or would you like to take a few minutes to compose yourself? That is an empowering statement. I'm telling you, I'm cool with continuing this conversation, but I'm setting boundaries. Not in this manner. Not if you're going to keep using profanity. Not if you're going to talk like that. So I'm letting you know in advance what your reward will be, by the way, if you act like a normal person. <laughs> and then at the end, I give you the empowering choice where I say, would you like to finish this now? Or would you like to take a few minutes and come back? So that's what I would do with the crier. I would say, Mark, I can see you're very upset by this. So why don't you take a glass of water and here's the tissue. Would you like to continue this conversation now, or would you like to take a few minutes and compose yourself and continue it in, let's say, five minutes? And if they do it again, you do it exactly the same, you do the same thing again. Mark, I can see again, you're really upset by this, so why don't you take a drink of water? Here's another tissue. Do you think you're okay to continue this conversation now, or would you like to take a few minutes, compose yourself, and we'll come back in five more minutes? And you keep doing that, letting them know. We're not going to avoid this conversation. We're going to have it. And we're not going to have it with you bawling that, like that either. That's not going to be a, a choice. You have two choices. Continue it now or later. And I'm giving you the choice. So you're in charge here. Because I always want to give people the feeling that they are in charge. You know, that I, want to, I don't want to box somebody in and make them feel as though I'm telling them what to do. Because that doesn't serve me. Right? And... I always have a choice to make when it comes to communication. Sometimes our ego gets in the way, and I want to show you. No, no, you're not calling the shots here. I am. But generally speaking, it's going to be more effective if I allow people to feel as though they are in control. Because I can choose to either be right or effective. I can choose to be seen as what I believe to be powerful or effective. So giving people an empowering statement helps you decide and puts you in control more often than not. But... It's by letting other people believe that they're in control. It's effective. That's an empowering statement. So I would use those as well as, as, well as my props. And don't forget your empathy statements. 
I can see you're really upset. <laughs> By the way, remember that there is a danger phrase when it comes to empathy. Oh, I know just how you feel. You know, when you say to somebody, I know just how you feel, or I know how you feel, what do people tend to think or say, Andrew? You don't know how I feel. You do not. So there's a big difference between saying, I know how you feel, and I can understand how you feel, or I can understand why you're upset. You know, if I were to say, I understand why this upsets you, that's simply saying, I can comprehend the chain of events that have led you to feel the way you currently feel. It's not me, but I can certainly understand why you would feel that way, you know? So that's, that's, that's the big difference there. I hope that helped you with your crybaby, and let me know how it goes, okay? If you can let me know how it goes or have any other questions about the crybaby, uh, make sure to send me an, a, a comment below and add your Twitter account. We're doing these Periscope videos, which are super fun. I never thought I would like them. You know, I don't really like telephones, you know, social media. I've had kind of a social, I've had kind of a telephone phobia since smartphones came out, honestly. <laughs> and I'm just now starting to get into it. And I'm trying to find that fine line, you know, where I can use my phone and not exclude the rest of the world. Especially because, did anybody see that report? Uh, we have this, what you call a vagus nerve. I mean, it's called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve goes from brain down into your navel. And it's an actual, I guess, nerve that is kind of plucked, like the strings of a guitar, that when it's plucked, you feel good. You feel a connection with the rest of the world. You feel something, you know? And you pluck it by making actual connections with other people. It's an, it's an, emotional, it's an emotional pick that flicks the string of your vagus nerve. And the challenge that I believe a lot of people are facing these days is we all need to flick that string, but you can't do it virtually. You know, you can't do it texting or uh, sending messages or on a, you know, on different, different social media uh, outlets, for example. I, I, a lot of people will go to Facebook, which I, I don't really go to it, but you will go to Facebook to fulfill an emotional need. We go there so that we can feel a connection with the rest of the world. In general, that's why we are doing it. But we don't get the satisfaction that we're looking for from that connection. And so people have more resources than ever before to help us feel connected, but we are feeling more isolated than ever before in human history. And I believe one of the reasons is we are not properly flicking our vagus nerve. So we might wanna start communicating with people more in person like we always have, <laughs> and we would feel a little bit differently about our connection with the world. Um, do we have any questions? Hey, Kips! Be who? Beth? Beth? Oh. Hey, Beth. Oh, thank you, Beth. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jolanda. You look so fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, Grace, uh, and thank you, you're, you're, she's a member? Yeah. Thanks, Grace, for being a member and for asking the question. Uh, her question is how to, talk, how to uh, respond to a condescending boss. My mom? <laughs> what is she, my mother says what? I do, I have a dinner date with my mother, okay. Um, let's put mom on. Let's put mom on the show. What do you think, guys? I think we need to. Um, we, she needs to come out of hiding. Uh, and the, going back to the question, if you could give me a more, a, a, Beth, if I could have a specific example of the type of condescending things that your boss is saying to you, that would be helpful because I'm not, I'm just, you know, there's, there's so many different ways to be condescending. And if I could get some more specificity, that would be very helpful. I'm, yeah, is she, is she, what? Okay, because I'm thinking, uh, I'm off the top of my head in case I can't get that secondary feed, uh, this, you know, the supporting document. Um, I tend to ask when people are making condescending comments, whatever it may be, for example, it could be like, Dan, why don't you take this Jones project? I think even you could handle that, you know, or something like that. When people are making passive, when people are making condescending comments, 
they tend to be passive aggressive, right? They're being insulting to you. They're just not being totally upfront about it. And that's what makes it so difficult for many of us to respond to them in a, in an effective way because they're not being upfront. And the definition, my definition, so I guess it's the definition of, of assertive communication is I'm going to be clear, direct, and upfront with my communication. We can do that in many different ways. You know, we don't need to be harsh about it. We can be clear, direct, and upfront in a variety of different circumstances and ways. And when somebody is being passive aggressive and saying insulting things like that, that are condescending in that example that I gave, they don't want to be called out on their behavior and forced to be clear because that's not their style. You know what I mean? That's not their game plan. They do not roll like that. What they do is they make underhanded comments that are difficult for most people to point out and call them on. So don't reward their behavior by letting it go. Don't reward their, beha their behavior by engaging and, and being difficult like them because what gets rewarded gets repeated. So if your boss is frequently being condescending to you, hey, first, hey, yeah? She responded, she talks down to me like I'm dumb like I'm dumb for asking a question. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so you ask a question and she talks down to you like you're dumb. Got it. Okay. Perfect. That works with the example that I'm going to give. Um, remember, first of all, that's Beth, right? Yeah. No, okay. Abby, great. Abby, great. I apologize, Abby. Um, so, Abby, remember that at the beginning, I believe that I heard something as along the lines of, this is frequently happening to you. You know, your boss is, is doing this a lot. And if they are, remember, first time was about them. If they've done it now five times, that's about you. <laughs> and I don't mean to say that you are childish or that you are asking dumb questions. I mean, the first time, that's about the difficult person who's being condescending. The tenth time, that can no longer be about them because they've done it to us ten times. So that must mean they are getting the reward that they're looking for. It might be difficult to pinpoint what is the reward that we're giving them, but I'll guarantee that if they keep doing it and it's a pattern, that pattern is now about you because it's something that you are giving them that is causing them to keep coming back to the well. You know, they would not keep coming back. You're the well, Abby. They would not keep coming back to Abby the well if Abby did not have any water for them or if Abby the cash machine stopped giving out cash machine, they would find a new ATM to go to. If she stopped giving out cash, she'd find a new ATM to go to. That said, be very, be very uh, conscious of the reward that you're giving your boss, okay? And take it away. Do not give her that reward anymore. I'm assuming that the reward is you take it. You know, you, you remain silent. You, maybe you're not saying anything back to her. And therefore, she gets the feeling of superiority because she just said that. Maybe it's in front of other people. Whatever, if it's, if it's in front of other people or not. She's getting a satisfaction from saying that to you. But if she's being upfront about it and not being called up on the behavior, do that. Call her on it. But that's difficult to do in the moment. So remember this. This is going to be a spotlight question. And a spotlight question is going to be a question that you ask somebody in many different situations, but especially this kind, that makes them clarify their true intention. I might even ask a clarifying question. Clarifying questions and spotlight questions differ in the length. A spotlight question is a question that simply begins with, are you trying to, for example, you know, here, do this, I think you would, or wait a minute, you ask a question like, should I, your boss says to you, hey, take this to the bank by five. And you say, should I take Main Street? And she were to say, I don't know. Don't you drive a car? You know, I don't know. Haven't you done this before? Should I get somebody else who can handle this instead? You know, whatever the comment is. You could ask a simple spotlight question which starts with, are you trying to insult me when you say that? Are you trying to be condescending when you say that? Are you trying to say that I am incompetent? Are you trying to say whatever? That's a simple spotlight question, okay? That might be effective. If you want to ask a clarifying question, which takes a little more time and is a little more pointed, you may think that that's a better option. You would know. The, the clarifying question is very similar. It just repeats back what they said first. So you would say, 
by the way, it also gives you time to think. You know, if, you're, if you have trouble thinking on your feet in these situations because you become emotional, that's normal, so that's okay. But this will give you some time to kind of remember your words. If you start off by saying, when you say, and then repeat back what they said, when you say that you could give this to somebody else if I don't think I can handle it, or when you say, wow, even I could do something like this, it's such a simple job, or when you say, when you ask a question like that, I wonder who trained you. Repeat back what they said. Then say a phrase that begins with, are you trying to? So when you say that even I could handle a task like this, are you trying to say that I can't handle most tasks because I'm incompetent? When you say that that was a stupid question, are you saying that you believe I'm a stupid, incompetent person? So kind of... Well, no, that's not even exaggerating. <laughs> Repeat back to them what they just said and then say to them, are you trying to say, and then put it right out there what you believe they're trying to say. Don't exaggerate it. That would be more like uh, something I would do with the judge. But so when, when you ask me, when you, excuse me, when you say, Dan, when you ask that type of question, I say yada, yada, yada. Or Dan, you look like you just started when you ask me a question like that. Are you trying to say that I'm incompetent because I ask you questions? Are you trying to say, or it could be something, for example. It could be something, uh, it could be something like this. When you say yada yada, are you trying to say that you don't want me to ask these questions? And she might say, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. I don't want you to ask questions. I want you to just go ahead and do what I'm asking you to do. Figure it out. You know, let's say that she were to say that to you. Wouldn't that be great? Like, if you got the truth, you know, if you got the answer, and then all of a sudden things were clarified, you might even think, Abby, you might even think, huh, she keeps saying these things to me because she could not find the words to tell me that I ask too many questions. And, and I'm, just, I'm just suggesting that this might be a wonderful surprise ending, you know? Where if you were to ask, when I ask you a question and you tell me that that was a stupid question, are you trying to say that I'm a stupid person and you don't want me to ask you questions? She might say to you, yes, I'm trying to say that I don't want you to ask me questions. I don't think you're stupid, but I think you sound stupid when you ask questions like that all the time. Let's say she said that. Then all of a sudden you would know, okay, I can just do things my way. And maybe she's okay with that as long as I just do them and stop asking questions. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, it might be a really simple game-changing moment for you. But ask people, are you trying to say this? And it puts people on alert that if they're going to be passive-aggressive with you, you're going to call them on it and force them to be upfront with you. And that takes away their rewards. And in the future, if she does want to tell you something like, I don't want you to ask questions, I just want you to do it she'll be more likely to say that to you and avoid these types of situations where you're thinking, why is she being so insulting? You know what I mean? Maybe she's trying to be upfront, but needs your help. So help her and ask her when you're trying to say this, do you mean to say that? And that could help both of you in the end. There you go. Okay. Any other questions? I know that Andrew has to go. He has a big hot date. I think she's so great and young. I think she's so young. Okay. Well, you have a relative who calls your teenage girls fat and ugly? Um, I, first of all, I can't imagine why you would be around that person the second time. So I don't know why this is a recurring experience. She calls them fat and ugly. Here's what I want to clarify. And let's do this on the next episode. Please clarify, how is this coming about? Are they saying it to the girls? Like, is, are, is she saying to your girls, you know, hey, fatso, or... Here, I got this sweater for you. I figure it wouldn't really make any difference what it looked like because you're so ugly. How, how do these insults come out? Or is she, is she saying it to you? Is she saying things like, do you really think that's the best outfit for her? Do you really think, does she, does she have a boyfriend or you know, do guys like girls like her? You know, is, are they being upfront about it? Are they saying it to you? Are they saying it to them? What's the context? I need to know because that would change the answer quite a bit. <laughs> 
So she tells your girl, she says these things to your girls. And I know, by the way, I know that it's not that easy to simply cut relatives out of your life. So I know that. Uh, I'm going to address it in the next episode, because as you can see, it's very difficult for me to give a quick answer. Um, what time is it, Andrew? Six, six. Yeah, it's 6-6. It's, six, six. it's almost the time for Andrew to be transformed into his, his original state once it reaches 6 Six six. So I will see everybody. Um, I have to go. Maggie uh, is around here, but I'm going to answer that question. Please leave any more detail that you can about the insulting relative, because absolutely, let's talk about that. And Twitter, yeah, and your Twitter name, and I'll leave you a, a tweet. If, if you don't have Twitter, that might be a good video for just a regular video. Uh, so we are. Uh, Maggie disappears. She's really anti paparazzi these days. See if Buddy's around just to say hello and goodbye. If you could open the door while we say goodbye. Okay, so I know people wanted to say hello to uh, Buddy and Maggie, but remember, by the way, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, subscribe there, and check out our site at Dan O'Connor Training. We're still running the special on the VIP pass. Hey, oh, there's Maggie. Oh, look at her. Oh, she just is such a snob. Goodbye, Maggie. <laughs> hey, Buddy. Okay, for everybody here at Dan O'Connor Training, including Andrew and Buddy, Oh, I can hear Buddy tap, tap, tapping in. Hey, it's hi, baby. Hey, hey, hey. So there's Omega. See, she has to get in on the action once Buddy is. Okay, so we're all signing off. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Oh, Buddy wants me to scratch his belly. You can turn it off. They don't want to see his, his, his doggy junk. <laughs> Bye, guys. There's Max. There's Max. <laughs>